Um, so yeah, I'm managing security uh, in the Samsung IoT cloud division. Uh, I will talk uh, in details um, about this uh, a little bit later. I also have Sanjay with me. He will introduce himself uh, when he does his part of presentation. He's a security uh, architect in the same group. Um, and today we will be talking about making security agile. Uh, but before we go there, I just would like to ask some like silly questions. <laughs> How many of you are uh, excited about application security? <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, for the people who work in application security for a while, like more than five, ten years, I would rephrase it a little bit. How many of you are still excited about application security? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we're definitely like in the right place. Um, and um, before we go to our like main presentation, I would like to tell you why I am excited about application security after working in the domain for more than 10 years. So just take a look at this book. How many of you have read it in the past? So uh, yeah, quite a few folks. Um, so. The reason why I'm excited ad about application security is because application security is still an art. It's like programming 30 years ago, 40 years ago, right? Um, if you look how programming has evolved, everybody is talking today about SDLC, you know, about making it like really efficient, about getting to the market fast, about, you know, uh, finding resources everywhere in the world. So it's less fun, definitely it's less fun compared to what it was 30 years ago. Uh, with application security, it's different. We had three or four presentations here at this forum about security automation, and everybody is talking about different things. And our presentation is not an exception. I hope that we will add some value by un un uncovering a um, few tricks that you can utilize to make security more efficient, but it's still very much an art. It's not a routine, and this is, this is why uh, I'm excited about. There are a lot of room for creativeness, there are a lot of room for inventions, and this is what we're trying to do in our small group. So now let's just move uh, to how security was handled like five, 10 years ago. I think it's important to talk about this a little bit uh, because um, I talk to many security folks, I know many of them, and I think that uh, what we are doing is not very common. Uh, I've seen like many companies which are still using the old style um, approach to security, uh, which doesn't allow them to be very agile or very efficient. And I hope our presentation will help you to understand what needs to be changed uh, to become more agile, to address security concerns quicker, uh, to catch up with all those contemporary SDLC agile methodologies. And that's why like, I just want to walk you like, very quickly what we had in the past and how we transform it to an agile methodologies. So um, five, 10, seven years ago, um, all SDLC process was very much a waterfall, right? So you had all these like gateways, uh, you had business requirements, uh, you had architecture design, then you had coding, testing, so on and so forth. And it was um, relatively easy to adjust your security process to this model uh, because it was spread in time and you always knew what uh, will be done when, and you can adjust your security processes to meet uh, development processes. Um, so at that time, we had a luxury of full two-week security assessments. Uh, and it started with visiting developers and business teams on site and getting everyone on board. Uh, it like, could be like developers, database administrators, operations, business people, uh, everyone. And the resources were available and we could sit down with them on their side for two days and talk about, not, not only about security, but uh, the first step would be to understand how the system is built. After we knew that, we would go to the next step. We would create a very formal threat model. And when I said formal, 
I mean that we use this kind of, you know, probably like many of you heard about that. How many people heard about that? Uh, so this is actually methodology that would help you to um, assign a risk score in a pseudo-scientific manner, as I call it. Uh, why it's pseudo-scientific? Uh, because all these categories, if you look at them, they are, you know, not better in sense of assessing, uh, assigning a score than just the whole thread. So you can do that if you want. You, you would spend like a lot of time trying to understand what your um, risk score in each category is. Or you just like simply use uh, this traditional high medium law, right, approach. Just by using your experience, by analyzing the business environment and the vulnerability itself. Uh, so you will see that eventually we got rid of this because this, 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 this approach was not efficient. Then another one was stride, of course. This uh, when you need to categorize the, your um, uh, findings and um, put it to categories and then report it appropriate, appropriately. Um, we use stride, we use it a lot. And I think it's better than dread and it's not completely dead. And I know some uh, security professionals still use it. But still, in my view, it's like too abstract. Uh, because uh, when you have a vulnerability, first of all, it's very difficult to find the right category. The second problem is that sometimes when you have one vulnerability, it fits to almost all categories. For example, like if you think about weak password policies, it will fit to almost everything. And then the question is, what is the point, right? So eventually we got rid of this as well. And instead we switched to CVE. CVE uh, made more, more, more sense to us because um, it's usually generated automatically by all known um, dynamic scanners and we don't even need to do much. And most importantly, they reflect reality better because they're talking about like very specific problems like authentication, authorization, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is like yet another like interesting thing that we did. Um, we were trying to evaluate the resi residual risks uh, which are coming from vulnerabilities. So we took into consideration dread score you see it on X is X. And uh, we took into consideration uh, control rating as well. So you can implement very good controls or you might have no controls. So if your controls are good, this is number five, you will see that your residual score will be zero even if your dread score is high. And other way around, right? If your control rating is uh, zero, then uh, dread, red, uh, residual score will be high even if your dread score is one, only one. Uh, another interesting thing. So we were trying like to plot everything and present it to our executives using heat maps. And uh, on heat maps, uh, you will see two things. On X, um, you will see the risk, which is uh, coming from all vulnerabilities that you found for applications. On X, uh, Y, you see safeguard index, which is coming from this uh, evaluating of security controls that have been already implemented. So being on the top left is good been on the right bottom was bad. So it looked very well, like everybody understood it, we liked it. Uh, and another interesting thing. So all, all, like our, after we were done with our threat modeling, we would proceed with penetration testing. And uh, penetration testing at that time was more like a research, not, not like a something like automatic and routine. We did a lot of manual testing. Um, and we were looking down at all automated dynamic scanners. Uh, we were thinking about them as something like extremely inferior compared to manual testing. And we were using them just to determine where the security bugs are concentrated. When we found this component, then we would go uh, deeply inside and do manual testing. And this is like an example of one very good manual kind of testing when we were trying to estimate how random, random number generator was. And you can see from, we, we at, at that time we used web scarab, and you can see from this picture that, that there is def definitely a pattern. It's, it's not random by any means. So when they then opened the code, found where it's generated, we like really identified a very good problem. So again, just like to tell you that like it was like a very interesting research kind of work rather than some automatic uh, scan running. Uh, so just to summarize our old approach. Uh, 
we still like we're using all this doc, PDF, XLS files and communicating the results to developers. Um, we also were writing, of course, uh, nice executive summaries with all these pictures and maps and everything. Um, and after this is done, we would go to the second stage, which is actually working with developers on remediation, uh, a process which we informally was calling nagging. I can see like quite a few <laughs> my former colleagues, they know what it means. This is actually like, you are given a task, okay, you found it, now you're responsible to fix it. And then you have like 10 like business units to talk to, and you start talking to their managers, and of course it's not a priority for them. You're trying to escalate, it doesn't work well, and you don't look nice, and so on and so forth. So it was like very difficult to do that. Uh, and of course we supported uh, uh, security dashboards and uh, reported escalated all issues to CTO on a weekly basis. So it was a summary of the old model. And then what happened, Big Bang, uh, what it means, all this agile SDLC and uh, methodologies uh, um, been applied to many projects. And uh, we were looking at all this scrum projects and tasks flying over our head. Our head was spinning, we didn't know what to do first, next, and so on and so forth. So this is like where time when we realized we cannot, we cannot do it all the way. Uh, I think now it's like a very good time to talk about what is our product that we support now. I mentioned that uh, we develop an IAT cloud solution uh, that allows any IAT devices to connect and start transmitting data. So if you think about like millions of transmitting data, you would realize that it's a lot of data. So we, we have big data on backend, but most importantly, it's all API based. So you can use API to send data, then you can uh, use API to get data. Finally, you can use API to mine data and do analytics if you want to. Uh, we have a few applications built on top of these APIs, but they're not the major things that we are concerned about. Um, and needless to say that all of that is running in agile mode, uh, meaning that uh, we can have few uh, releases in productions per day. We're not taking like even weeks. So like we like releasing whenever we are ready. We have a very uh, strict process how it works. Uh, in this process, QA is a key element. We have like a very good and um, uh, efficient QA team, knowledgeable people who like actually work like, like programmers. They uh, create a lot of tests to cover all combinations of parameters, all APIs. If changes happen in an API, they would immediately create a test, put it to our like regression test suite, and no uh, production release would go to production until uh, QA is saying it's okay to do so. It's very important to understand this. This is like very specific to our group. And we will show you later how we utilize this process to do a better security. So as I said, we had no choice. We needed to, cha to, to, to change our uh, approach to security from waterfall to agile. And here are like some requirements which are coming from the reality that I just described. So we didn't have two, four full weeks for security purposes anymore or from ass for, for assessment or anything. Nobody cared or understood all the formalities that I talked about, all the uh, stride, the red, the heat maps, nobody cared, you know. Uh, do whatever you want and just make sure that we are secure. Uh, it was simply impossible to have these two full days interviews to get all these people on board. First of all, again, because like we are very agile, and the second one is uh, because our team is very distributed. We have people like everywhere in the world and just getting them in the same room is simply not possible. Uh, nobody gives us environment for purely for security testing anymore. So we had to figure out how to work with QA uh, to make sure that we don't interfere with each other. Uh, and finally, like I think the most important thing that you would need to understand is that we need to work in parallel with everyone, with DevOps, with QA, to make sure that we are like, catching at least like the most you know, uh, important security bugs. Uh, there are some challenges which are not related to our product, which probably like more generic and coming from um, API-based products. Uh, so the, the first and obvious thing is that, of course, you cannot uh, tell 
the scanner, hey, here is URL, go scan it, go spider it, and do everything automatically. There is no such a thing as spidering, you know, in, in API. And even if scanner is smart enough, it understands where parameters are and tries to do some kind of injections, uh, it's still not a very good test because it probably like will inject something which is relevant to security, but it doesn't understand the business logic, right? Because it will insert some parameters and then like you will be getting uh, responses like 400 bad data, right? Um, in, I, if like your payload is not valid from business point of view, or you will be getting 404 if you put some invalid uh, parameters to URL in REST API calls, right? So that in, in REST API, you know, we have these entities encoded with some numbers. So like if you don't put the, the right one, then what is the purpose? So it, it means that like all your security payload is not going to read the application. It will be filtered out somewhere like on perimeter and that's it. So you're not really testing anything. Uh, so you can have like two approaches to, to solve this problem. First of all, you can, of course, get more people in security and ask them, let's just write code, security code for each and every use case that we have for each and every combination of parameters. But we don't have too many people, right? Our team is like usually from two to four people in security, that's it. Uh, the other approach that actually Sanjay will be talking about is to utilize the wells of QA tests which uh, have all parameters in place. And these parameters have a very good semantics from business point of view. So it's not a garbage. Whatever they do makes sense. So our task would be just to utilize all this traffic and to see what kind of security problems we might find. So it's coming. Sanjay is going to talk about this. A uh, few aggravating factors about security testing. Um, if you compare with QA, QA is deterministic, right? In uh, application security testing, you always have false positives. I will show them in demo. And uh, you cannot really feed them uh, to developers. They will not be very happy about it. Um, yet another thing, even uh, if vulnerability is real, you still w want to assign the right priority and severity. Because sometimes, uh, more often than not, uh, dynamic scanners do not do this job well. So you need to, to, to explain to everyone um, what, what, what the severity is and what to do about this. And uh, of course, this uh, job of explaining vulnerability and remediation plan, it uh, belongs to OPSEC uh, team, especially when you have a lot of young engineers who are not familiar with security at all. So uh, taking all these factors into consideration, this is how we came to a solution. Um, we made the hypothesis that we need some kind of uh, framework where we can take our inputs security-related input from different sources, and we can import them to one place and then analyze. Um, the other important thing is that we need to do it in automated manner. Remember I told you about like our process? QA said yes, it goes to production, so we need to make sure that our test runs before QA, right? To make sure that it's okay from security point of view. Um, and of course it should allow manual testing as well, uh, because um, as I mentioned before, we do not completely trust to dynamic. So each time when we have a new feature, new product, we still need to do manual testing. Uh, this is how our solution looks like. Uh, so we decided to use uh, ThreadFix as our security dashboard. And as you probably know, ThreadFix uh, has MySQL database where all found vulnerabilities uh, can be stored and searched later on. Um, we did some development uh, on ThreadFix side and Danny Group has noticed our no, uh, effort and put us to the official contributors list. What we actually did, we did some improvements how um, the data is presented to make it more efficient. We added uh, notifications to make sure that if uh, we found something interesting like medium or high vulnerability, it will uh, go to our email immediately and we, need, we don't need to wait until somebody actually brings up your eyes and starts reviewing it. Uh, on the left side, you actually see the all sources of vulnerabilities that we use so far. This is Zap, of course, our manager tool, and Burp. They're actually equally important to us. We'll show how to work with either of them in this environment. 
then for new features and products, as I mentioned, we, we still like using manual testing, uh, but the results are generated in an XML format, which is understood by Threadfix, so we can easily enter them. And we use some custom tools, for example, Bscan, that I'm going to talk about, that allows to achieve a better level of configuration and automation. Then on the right side, you see Jira. So it means that we do not generate this XML PDF documents anymore. We review in the results, and if you think that it's valid, we review the severity and export it into Jira automatically. Um, and that's why you have the security artist at the top versus the people who review all that. And um, after this is done, ticket is created for DevOps team. If they have any questions, they can always come to us and we will talk together. Uh, uh, we will work together on, remedi on remediation. So this is like at very high level uh, how it works. Now Sanjay is going to provide more details. And after that, I'll show you how to use uh, Bscan to automate Burp and take advantage of QA regression. Thanks, Oleg. So my name is Sanjay Tambe. I work as a security architect uh, in the Internet of Things group within Samsung. Uh, my primary job is basically to make sure our cloud-based platform is secure. Uh, before I proceed too far, I want to ask you, all of you, how many of you are already using some form of security automation in your environment? Some of you, so few of you are already, great, good to know. So I, I know that each one will be having a different type of implementation. So what, today what I'm going to talk about is security, implementing security automation in your environment without, uh, with very minimum investment. Basically, you, we are, I'm going to show open source tools, but it can be done with variety of other commercial tools as well. So, uh, this is not a plug, by the way, but this, these are the th tools that work with ThreatFix, the, the, the core dashboard that we will be using that, that we use to consolidate all the scans that are done by the security automation. Uh, we will be using ThreatFix and it does support all kinds of uh, scanners and I'm sure you'll find something that you use in your environment. So I'm going to be talking about implementing um, in, uh, security automation using open source software. So primarily we'll use ThreatFix, Zap, uh, some form of cron job scheduler uh, and a MySQL. So Initially, I'm, I'm just going to give you rough, just to give, get you started, ThreatFix is available for a download from, uh, you know, there are a couple of links, and these, this deck will be available for you to download and uh, use so at your privilege. So I, I, you don't have to take uh, not down any notes or anything. I mean, um, so you install the ThreatFix, and once ThreatFix is up and running, you know, you want to use the default password and so on. Uh, the next step is basically install Zap. So I'm going to use only Zap uh, as um, a, a, as our primary scanner. The reason being, uh, you know, it's very easily available, it's very easy to configure, and we will run it in two modes. One is headless mode, and other one is uh, with the UI. So we will download this. It's an OAuth scanner um, tool, basically, uh, and You'll download it, install the Zap in your AWS or VM environment, and uh, also use install Zap on your laptop or desktop, whatever. The first one was for using in headless mode. Uh, the UI mode is used for creating a session. So you you know you you are web applications have login credentials. You want to make sure what is the logout condition, what is login condition, and it, it's very easy to configure. There are Zap has a variety of YouTube videos available for configuring these sessions that we are talking about. So you could use um, th th that help and configure your Zap. So the ultimate objective of this creating Zap, you are using Zap, is to create the session files, which you will upload to your Unix or Linux server or wherever uh, in uh, AWS and so, uh, so on, so that it can run it in an AW headless mode, run the scans at night, midnight, and fire it up, and you know, create the files and whatnot. Uh, so we'll talk about briefly those things. So configuring scans for web applications. So I'll just briefly talk about how you would do, you, you, whether you have five applications or 500, you know, you could create, use the same approach 
for configuring the, uh, the scans. So ThreadFix needs, uh, when you install ThreadFix, you will get, you can generate your own API key. And that's what this um, is basically the, which you have to set up yourself and your URL. So it, it, I'm using it on my laptop in a local host environment. So it will be 127, so, so on. But you will use your own um, UI, uh, URL. Uh, next one is you just create a shell script file to run the scan. Now the first, the very first part is a, a sh shell command. You know, you're run, running the zap in a headless mode, but all that it does is basically it continues, scans your application, uses the session file which you have uploaded from your laptop, and creates an XML file. So this file is then later on uh, uploaded to ThreadFix. Uh, so that's the whole purpose of each and every shell file is. You will also create another shell file called all.sh, where you will, all your 50 applications will be, you can scan together, and these files will be used for running on-demand scans. So if you run, want to run scan one at a time manually, you could just go to the cron job scheduler, you could use any web-based cron job scheduler where you can say on-demand scan, or you can schedule it to run at midnight every day and so on. So all those things are easily available as an open source, and you would do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly demo the security automation that I have configured on my laptop here. So oh, this doesn't let me see two things. <laughs> okay. So basically, what I'm going to do is. Uh, Sorry, we will need this together. All right. Okay. So uh, what I have done is I created one application called Budget. And it's a it's a intentionally badly written application that has a lot of security vulnerabilities. So I have downloaded. It looks like this. Uh, it has a store. You can uh, create buy products. Say you want to buy this, and you add it to your basket, and so on. So it's like a you know uh, shopping cart application with you purchases and so on. So but it has a lot of vulnerabilities. So I created a. Uh, budget applications within the thread fix uh, and set up the scan to run every day uh, at midnight and so on. Of, of course, I, I, on my laptop, I didn't do it that way, but you could do it that way. And it up creates, runs the scan, uploads the file to in an XML format to thread fix, and it creates, uh, it scans it, it thread fix normalizes your XML file. and uploads the, uh, and uh, shows the results in a nice graphical format as well as, it can also send you alerts, email alerts to, uh, to, to take action. So these alerts will be, you go, will go to security professionals like you guys, and uh, not to the dev team, so you don't want them because to review it. So objective is any major issues, any major medium risk, high risk, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, you would see them first, you would receive the emails, you would look at them immediately, and the way you would look at it is basically, so, so the way you would do, look at it is, uh, let's say I want to look at SQL injection, so view more information, and let's say you, based on the information that you have, you can see the more findings and so on. Let's say after lo looking at all the data that you have, you decide, okay, yeah, this is the issue that developers should fix. We go back here and say, select, I want to file this as a defect, and I have configured it as a JIRA defect, so I'm going to, but I'm not going to submit anything, but you could do something like this, and the issue will go into the JIRA to your development team. And it will have the threat fix will include all the necessary information that they need uh, for them to fix it. So along with the URL and all that. So that's one way to look at it. And then other things that you can do is <coughs> you could 
also mark this as a false positive. So, certain issues let us say come as a that you know that are not real issues uh, because of the tool that you use, you could mark it as false positive, you could set up email alerts and so on. So, let us go back to our presentation and So, I am going to talk briefly about, uh, I am running out of time. So, I am going to talk briefly about QA regression and this is the main thing I would like you to take away. You know, once you have thread fix running and you have web application scanned and all that, but I think the QA has created a wealth of test cases, in our case thousands. I mean, uh, you, you know, we, we have the, the number of security people that we have, it is very unlikely that we could match them and uh, keep up with them the way the number of test cases they create on a daily basis. So, we are leveraging that. And not many organizations have testing automation in place, but whatever testing or automation, I'm, by what I mean by automation is regression that they might be using, you could leverage all those test cases in your environment. So, uh, that that's the, the main purpose of this is to use those, and I, I have used that with Zap and Burp to, uh, in the security automation. So, first thing you would do, this is step one, is to create an application within ThreadFix and uh, you know you would write down the application IDs which they give you one two three whatever. Uh, the next step is to start Zap in a headless mode. Now in previous case for web applications we use command line and you know in one step everything was done. Here it's a multiple steps for QA regression. You would start Zap. The commands that the part that is in red I don't know visible or not, but basically I'm running it on port 8085 in a headless mode. That's all uh, I'm saying. Uh, next step is um, so configure and start QA regression. Now, you would have to work with little bit or with QA regression because you should, for before you run it as a, with the using proxy, you actually have to run the QA regression yourself fully on your own and obviously there are certain tweaks that you may have to do on your computer or whatever environment that you run it. So, run it without doing any anything security. So, run QA regression and then modify some of the script uh, configuration file, properties file to use a proxy. So, if you, it will use a port 8085 that you, you, would, you already started in the previous step. You would use that proxy. And let us say in our environment, uh, we use Maven. So, we have the command and we just tell that, that to use the proxy. Uh, <coughs> next one is, um, next step four and five is save your security settings. Now, you would Create, create the XML file at the end of your regression, save it as an XML, and in the next step, upload it to um, ThreadFix. So, all these steps can be automated, and you could run the QA regression on demand, or if you want to run it at midnight, and so on. So, this is a separate regression, QA regression than what the QA is already doing. Let the, let the QA do their own regression, and they can use their own proxy, or without the proxy, security proxy. But for security purposes, you would do that uh, with the proxy and then identify issues and so on. Uh, all this can be put in, in a script. So with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Oleg and he will continue the next step. So, uh, yeah, in the very beginning, I said that uh, AppSec is very much like an art, not a routine. And uh, this is a perfect example, you know, how you can utilize uh, resources um, which are not in your team, in QA team, to leverage a better security. So, I think, like, it was, like, very cool thing that we implemented, and we're actually very proud of it. I didn't see anyone else is doing that. Now, uh, Sanjay was talking how you can do it with... Uh, um, Zap, right? And like I will uh, talk a little bit about this uh, tool that you can um, uh, find uh, as open source in uh, Ruby, uh, 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 Ruby, Ruby Gem uh, repository. Uh, this uh, gem is called Bscan, and uh, there are like uh, certain features uh, that uh, allows you to improve the level of automation, uh, especially when uh, you heavily use Burp in your security testing. So what, what it al allows you to do is just uh, uh, to write uh, your uh, tests in, in Ruby, which I think is much cooler than, than Java. And uh, it allows adding your custom um, tests to the same scan, which are not probably related to Burp at all. Uh, but uh, most importantly, of course, you can use it to run uh, 
uh, burp uh, in headless mode. And uh, at the same time, you can um, configure both B-scan uh, by providing some, par some, some parameters for your testing and uh, by providing parameters which are related to burp as well. Uh, actually, you would be surprised like if you print out all parameters which are poorly documented in, in BURP. You will see that there are a lot of them and uh, you may want to take advantage uh, uh, of uh, like better configuration to, uh, if you understand what they actually mean. Uh, so uh, since you don't have too much time, I just will run very fast. So this is like how configuration uh, file for uh, B-Scan looks like. And um, you can see like two uh, major sections here. On the top, this is uh, B-Scan settings. And um, they I probably like need to walk you through so you would understand the demo better. So the, the first one is B-Scan and activity timeout. So what it means that if uh, uh, BERT proxy doesn't receive any requests in 20 seconds, it, everything will be terminated and reports will be generated. Um, then the next one is issues where all issues will be stored, just the directory name. Um, then the next one is saying that I want to run BERP in proxy mode. That's one is uh, uh, run proxy is true. Uh, the next one is like very interesting. Uh, you can see uh, URL prefixes which are followed by uh, websites that I'm going to test. Uh, other way around, you, you, you see like um, URL prefix which is uh, uh, followed by uh, XML report name where the results will be stored. It means that like when I test google.com, the results will be generated and stored in a XML file called google.xml. And for whiteheadsecurity.com, the results will be stored in wh.xml file. I hope Jeremy is not watching us, what we are doing to his website. Uh, okay, so uh, the next one, uh, everything else will go to report all.xml. So it's configurable. Why it's important? If, if you look at the results in ThreadPix, you really want to know what application these findings belong to, right? And uh, th th that's why like, you want to have some kind of uh, configuration to make sure that you separate your uh, vulnerabilities by application. And application usually has some unique URLs that you might want to use here as a prefix. Uh, then two other parameters are important as well. Uh, you will see that I have ignore info and ignore low level severity flags, I install them to false here just for the purposes of this demo. Um, in real life, of course, it should be true because you will have a lot of false positives and you don't want to pay attention to low and info. Uh, then the next section is burp setting. What I'm saying here that when uh, uh, burp is working, it can like uh, bring the number of threads up to 10. Um, we don't want to intercept and store uh, requests. And the last one is very important. This is like when I said that uh, um, BURP uh, configuration is very obscure. This is where you can see it. Uh, actually, what I wanted to do here, I want to change the uh, port on which uh, BURP jar will be listening on, right? By default, it's what, 8080, right? I wanted to have it 8083. So it has a bunch of fields that I don't understand, but I know that if I change this one, it, it, it will actually start and, and listen on port 8083. Uh, and this is like how, again, I'll try to run all that. Uh, I hope that connection works well. This is what I'm going to do. Um, I, instead of like our QA regression test that Sanjay was talking about, I just will use a couple of curl commands. One will be sending a request to Google homepage, another one to Whitehead. Uh, page. And at the same time, uh, the proxy will be running and listening on all this traffic and it will try to find some vulnerabilities. So let's just try to do that. So if I run without proxy, of course, connection is refused because uh, the proxy is not running yet. So let's just uh, try to start the proxy. So it will take some time because uh, uh, Java, uh, uh, JRuby is loading Java, Java is uh, loading, okay, it started now. So uh, now let's just uh, uh, do white sec. And you, ca you can see that some like scan issues had been created right away. We will take a closer look. I have only 20 minutes time out, so I need to run Google as well. It found some issues as well. So now let's just wait a little bit. 
And while we wait and take a look at this vulnerability um, application, uh, cookie was used by the application and doesn't have the secure flag set. So quiz for you, considering uh, the latest Google site implementation. Is it an issue for Google or not? What do you think? I, I have like a hint. All, all, all connections at Google are HTTPS. So why would we care about security flag in a cookie right now? It will be encrypted. Nothing can be sent over HTTP. So in my view, it's not an issue. Right? Okay, so uh, let us check if you have um, this report. So you see, like, we generated a couple of res uh, uh, reports, uh, White Hat XML and Google XML. Let us take a look at uh, White Hat. And let us search for medium. Okay, it found some, like, presumably found some medium vulnerability at White Hat security website. Is it true or not? Most likely it's not. I did some kind of research. And just like to demonstrate it, that all these tools, they generate a lot of false positives. So it's saying like medium, uh, like while there is no like anything medium in this. Uh, I don't want to go to details. Let's just return to our presentation. So and uh, needless to say that all these XML files are compatible with Threadfix, so like I can easily like do uh, get another job that will take this XML file and upload them automatically to the Threadfix. So this is like probably important. This is what you want to know how to transform uh, your old approach to security to agile approach to security. This is what we did, and probably it will be useful for you as well. So instead of this uh, uh, full two days threat modeling meetings uh, with many people involved, we just participate in, in um, a discussions through collaboration tools like uh, Confluence and so on and so forth. It, it works very well again because like our team is distributed, we just cannot meet in person. Um, all this like pseudo-scientific as I call them, methodologies like Dread, Stride, and others alike are gone. We don't use them anymore. Um, instead of that, we just like writing recommendation in Jira coming from architecture, design discussion, and from real vulnerabilities. Uh, Dread was converted to HML which everybody understands, Stride uh, is generated automatically through CVE. Um, we don't need to do anything for that. Um, instead of doing manual pen testing for everything, uh, we do very selective uh, pen testing for the areas of the biggest interest for us, new features, no, new products, especially if they're re related to security. Um, we are not using expensive security scanners anymore. Um, and this is good because, again, as we run in our startup mode, the budget is limited. Budget is always limited. So like if somebody is saying to you that security has money for everything they want to buy, it's not true. So using free Zap and almost free Burp is a good solution for this. Um, docs and PDFs are gone. Instead of that, we're just exporting everything to Jira from Threadfix. And there is no any like manual uh, running and uploading, everything is run automatically. And to summarize it like even shorter, I would use some Lean Startup principles. The first one, stop wiring buttons that nobody will ever push. Remember all this like old stuff that I talked about in the very beginning is gone and you don't need it and nobody cares. Uh, the, the second one is <laughs> important. Very often like when you go to conferences reading uh, books like you see people uh, start creating like new popular buzzwords like security as code, security as service, DevSecOps, and they do not make any sense to me. So instead of instead of coming up with all this like you know <laughs> lingo, just uh, do the real job, do security automation. But whatever you do, remember you cannot, you still cannot do it without security artists. You still need uh, people to take a look at this and uh, tell if this is real or not evaluate it, work with developers. That's why you do need security artists. And speaking of which, <laughs> this is like, uh, probably some of you followed this drama on Twitter. Uh, this is old Navy fashion house come up with the design of the T-shirt, which looks like that. And, uh, I don't know, pissed off many artists. 
because <laughs> I don't know why they did it. In my view, artists, it's like, you know, the most creative people on earth, and I would love all my three kids to be artists. Uh, so needless to say that artists, who are like very creative people, uh, responded with this, <laughs> which I like, of course. We decided to join the campaign and change their response a little bit. So like if you ever come to work for our team, I promise I will get this kind of t-shirt for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>